On Tuesday, the Standing Committee of the 13th National People's Congress, China's top legislature, passed a draft law on safeguarding national security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So, what signals does that send? What are the law's key points? And what impact will it have on Hong Kong? To discuss these issues, I'm pleased to be joined by Lawrence Ma, Barrister and Chairman of Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation, Dr. Edward Tse, Founder and CEO of the Gaofeng Advisory Company, and Professor Liao Fan from the Institute of International Law at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, Mr. Mar, uh, why don't we start with you? Because I was told that you were involved in the consultation process of this national security law for Hong Kong. Uh, could you please give us a general uh, overview of this law? Well, there has been um, four <coughs> major areas to tackle. For example, we have to discuss whether um, there will, will be sufficient um, uh, reference towards, for example, succession offenses, which is a major part of the uh, uh, NPC. SC, NPC decision. The other aspect is subversion, subversing, overthrowing the government. The third aspect we discussed was um, anti terrorism. And the fourth aspect is collusion or collaboration with a foreign power to influence the uh, local Hong Kong government. Now, so these four major aspects of the law were under. Uh, intense discussion and discussions about rights of citizens and suspects. For example, is there going to be retrospectivity of the offense? And it seems that the decision is there will not be retrospectivity. And we also have to discuss rights to protect suspects. For example, the existing rights under right of uh, silence, right to legal representation, presumption of the innocence and the um, rule against double jeopardy, those rights to um, safeguard a suspect would still be in place and those um, um, are discussed. And the very important aspect is whether we should have minimum sentence for any uh, offenders that has been convicted in Hong Kong. There has been no minimum sentence in our common law system. There's only maximum sentence. But it seems that the upcoming law may have a minimum sentence imposed upon a conviction. Now, those are areas that was um, un under discussion. And also whether that the appointment of uh, judges as well as jury, uh, jury, whether we should have jury in these of national security matters um, and, and, and so on and so forth, whether we should have an open court or a closed court, for example, when dealing with national security offenses. So those, those are matters that we discussed in the um, closed door session. And Mr. Xie, uh, what, is your, what is your understanding about this law and also the timing of the passage of the law? Yeah, my understanding of the law is that it came about uh, after almost one year of uh, uh, unrest in Hong Kong. Uh, as you know, there were a lot of protests, a lot of riots, uh, and there were different factions of people who were asking for different, uh, different things. Uh, but overall speaking, uh, you know, during this long, prolonged period, the uh, Hong Kong economy was really uh, jeopardized uh, in a significant manner. Uh, and of course, the COVID-19 didn't help things either. But nonetheless, uh, you know, much of the activities that was going on in the last year were related to the four areas that Mr. Ma was referring to. And I believe that uh, the central government, together with the Hong Kong government, and frankly, the majority of the Hong Kong people all felt that uh, it was the right time. It would be the right time to institute uh, a law to, uh, to, to address these kind of issues because we can't allow this to continue to go on. In terms of the timing, you know, this, this is the time, uh, you know, one year of unrest and protest is a long time. And uh, we need to come up with uh, a new legislation that we can address these kind of core issues. So this is as good as time as it could be. And do you think with the passage of law, security and peace will return to the streets in Hong Kong? I think that would be the ex expectation of most of the people here, including businesses. And of course, there will be people who wouldn't agree with that, and people, some people would, uh, would, uh, would not 
agree uh, with that uh, expectation, but I would say that most people would expect that. In fact, uh, just in the last couple of days, as you know, uh, there has been quite a number of uh, you know, very activist uh, people who have uh, declared that they're either are, are going to leave the political scene or their wh whatever organization that they're affiliated with, they're going to you know, get, they're gonna, uh, you know, uh, uh, get out of the organization. They're not going to be affiliated with the organizations anymore. You already s are seeing a lot of, um, in a way, reactions from uh, people who are objecting to the law. And I think there's already early indications that things are going in the right direction. And Mr. Liao, do you think uh, what uh, Mr. Xie just mentioned, maybe the law uh, uh, is already uh, serving a purpose uh, apart from the uh, legal sense because uh, some of those activists uh, in Hong Kong already are doing uh, some, something retrenching uh, in Hong Kong? Yeah, actually, I share the opinion of uh, Mr. Sheer. Actually, this law can be seen as a uh, implementation of the uh, National People Co People's Congress decision to have in place uh, the legal systems and uh, implementation mechanism necessary to safeguard national security in Hong Kong, uh, which decision was passed in uh, May 28th. Actually, after the pass of that decision, we've already seen some active uh, positive signals in, in Hong Kong, including some uh, uh, political uh, figures, their attitude have actually uh, changed uh, this way or that. And I noticed that actually... Uh, with because they are the, fearful uh, of uh, offending uh, the national security. I law. guess so. I guess so. Now, because we have this law against the, those kind of uh, illegal behaviors, and according to this law, uh, the local laws, uh, the already existing laws of Hong Kong, if they are inconsistent with this uh, secure, national security law, then the national security law uh, will prevail. A and that means uh, the national security law is higher above the local laws of Hong Kong. I is that a correct understanding, Mr. Liao? I guess you can, you can see, see that this way. But this is only natural because first, I mean, this law was passed by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress under the special authorization of the National People's Congress, which means it actually has the, uh, uh, the validity, has the effect, has authorization as any other law passed by the National People's Congress. This is the first point. And, and second point, actually, uh, before the uh, return of Hong Kong, actually, the basic law uh, clearly stipulates that any law that will continue to be effect, effective in Hong Kong will be those laws that are, in cons uh, that are consistent with the basic law. So by the same token, I mean, the national uh, security law of Hong Kong have made this same mm. uh, provision. So this is only natural and, and quite logical, actually. And Mr. Ma, I, I want your take on this because, of course, basic law is considered as mini constitution for Hong Kong and some critics say the national security law for Hong Kong will overrule the Hong Kong SAR's basic law. W what do you think? Well, you have to look at it from the, from the aspect of um, human rights protections. Now, the basic law, put, there's a Article 27 which protects human rights. Now, it gives people freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. Now, those are those are general rights, we understand, the general rights. This is a general protection of rights. Now, those general rights come from the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And there is an exception to this general right. The exceptions are three. First, national security. Second, public security. And third, um, health, and, um, uh, health and hygiene. So, so those are exceptions to the general rights. So for example, if a country enacts a law pursuant to a, to a national security reason, the freedom of expression, freedom of speech can be limited by that specific law. So if we now have a national security law specifically on the topic of national security, so that would has the effect and legally limit or restrict any uh, general rights. Mm. So that would, the national security law will take precedent on that aspect over the general freedom of expression. Yeah. 
uh, and Mr. Xie, uh, is this unique here in China, or there are similar uh, prevalent things all around the world? For example, the law stipulates crimes against national security, including secession, subversion, terrorist, and collusion with foreign powers. Uh, do similar statutes also include it in laws elsewhere in, in the world? Well, I'm not a legal professional, but based on my common sense knowledge, uh, <laughs> you know, many, many countries in the world, maybe even all countries in the world, will have the national security laws in some form or, or one another. Uh, you know, Hong Kong, uh, as an SAR, had not had the national security law since its handover back to Chinese mainland since 1997. So having a national security law, it's not a surprise, actually. It, it has been the responsibility of the Hong Kong government to legislate uh, a national security law under the basic law. But for various reasons, it wasn't been able to do that until this time when the NPC decided this is the time when they have to take the actions. So this is not some, you know, something that's really uncommon. And it's totally aligned with uh, the basic law uh, you know, conditions, as I understand it, under the uh, Annex 3 that it allows uh, the NPC to enact law that can be put uh, into Annex 3 of the basic law and de therefore it becomes a part of the basic law. And Mr. Liao, what do you say to those critics uh, saying that China is uh, abusing uh, this national security law uh, to cram down on human rights in Hong Kong and, and restrict freedom in Hong Kong? I, I don't I don't agree. Uh, I, I mean, th these critics, I think, they, they just I, I would say it's uh, it's quite uh, quite irresponsible, and some sometimes in some sense I can say it's, it's double standard. Because first, I, I doubt I doubt those uh, critics whether they have really read the uh, NPC's decision and the uh, draft uh, national uh, I mean the draft security law the text. Uh, really carefully uh, uh, read it. If they have done that, I mean, they would not, uh, in, in my judgment, they would not say those kind of irresponsible words. Because I guess M Mr. Ma has just explained, actually, national security is something that's so important that it, it, in these circumstances, it takes pre take precedence over those general rights uh, in, in those exceptional circumstances. I mean, what kind of uh, I mean, in, in what country? Uh, I mean, the right of uh, free expression and the right to free speech would allow a citizen, would mm. allow a person to do things that engender the national security of that country. Would Canada allow that? Would the U.S. allow that? If we check their domestic laws, we can, we can see those kind of uh, provisions in their domestic laws. Yes, we may have some minor difference in terms of what national security means, but basically it's the sovereign right of a state, of a country, to establish laws, to have in place legal mechanism to safeguard its national security. I mean, this is not abuse in any sense. It's just the legit legitimate power, and I would say the authority of a sovereign state to I mean, to actually uh, ensure that it can function uh, in a normal way. So mm. I don't agree with those critics uh, in, in any sense. And Mr. Ma, uh, now the legislation has wrapped up and people are looking forward to how the law will be enforced in Hong Kong. According to the law, the Hong Kong government will set up a new commission on state security and also, an office run by Beijing will be set up in Hong Kong to analyze security, collect intelligence, and deal with criminal offenses. Are these two uh, branches working in parallel, in concert? What has got to be the mechanism? Well, the office, you call it the office that was set, is set up here, um, it is known as the National Security um, office, we call it. It will have the manpower here um, to investigate, to coordinate, and to um, obtain um, 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 national security information um, that would be relevant to any 
uh, to detect, for example, any offenses that have occurred. And the local um, National Security Committee, which is headed by the um, chief, ex chief executive of Hong Kong SAR, um, would be responsible for implementation and policy-driven directions. So under that com com committee, you will have the um, police, you have the uh, 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 minister of, or, or the secretary for um, uh, security, you have the uh, um, immigration head, you have also um, the, the police, as I said, and those, those people will be responsible for the enforcement and implementation of the law. So the na national branch of that uh, of, of the national office would be feeding in um, information that which the Hong Kong government could not collect, for example, mm. um, and and it will obtain information. So the Hong Kong branch would be responsible for enforcement of the law. And also uh, about the judges, uh, the law gives the chief executive the power to appoint judges to hear uh, national security cases. Uh, do you think that will erode Hong Kong's judicial independence uh, to appoint a judge by the executive? Well, Hong Kong judges are appointed by the chief executive uh, it, under the basic law. Um, the, the, the point of attack is, is that they were picked by the chief executive to handle each and every particular case, but that, was, that is not the case. The list of judges that is to handle national security offenses are already existing judges. They are either in practice or they are either sorry, in office or they are either retired or just retired. So it is not a matter where the chief executive actually picks somebody, a particular judge, to handle a particular case so that to, for example, obtain a favorable result. And um, that this is not the case. The case is the judges are being. Um, there is a pool of judges already in Hong Kong, and the national security judges are more, so, more senior and experienced judges to be picked from that pool of judges to be allocated in here, so that when there is a case that happens, a judge will be appointed by the chief justice to handle a particular case. So it, it is not what they think that a, the chief executive would assign every particular judge or any particular judge to any particular case that mm. he wishes. A is it correct assumption that the chief justice will pick a judge on the merit, not on his national identity or, or, or passports? Yes, the, there has been a, um, a number of uh, suggestions that um, for, uh, judges that has a foreign nationality should not be allowed to handle national security cases. But that has not been accepted by the, obviously, by the standing committee. And so f judges in Hong Kong who has a dual nationality um, uh, would be able to hear national security cases if he or she fits within the category of an experienced senior judge. Uh, Mr. Xie, uh, uh, the central authorities uh, has kept mentioning that this national security law is only meant to deal with those offenders of national security and, and very small numbers of people, suspects. Uh, and the majority of the Hong Kong people shouldn't worry about uh, being involved in this. But do Hong Kong people uh, buy the message and what do they think about this law, uh, its, effect, its effect on their lives? Well, as I mentioned, uh, most of the Hong Kong people are pretty sick and tired of the unrest that has been going on for the last 12 months. And uh, most people are expecting a, m a period of uh, higher level of stability. And that, in fact, uh, you know, increasingly people are also not buying into the political rhetoric of, uh, you know, of the people who are pushing for their own ideas. Uh, so. In general, my feeling, you know, being a Hong Kong resident, uh, actually uh, having born and raised here and lived here almost all my life, mm. uh, and currently still living here, uh, I, you know, my, my feelings when talking to my friends, when I go to the streets and I read newspapers and so on, I, 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 have, I have a genuine feeling that people in Hong Kong are welcoming this new legislation. Of course, you know, there, will, there are people who don't like it. Uh, they are afraid of the implications of the laws. And as we mentioned, some of them have already uh, sort of uh, uh, get out from their own political affiliation. Uh, affiliation. Uh, but in general, uh, I think the people in Hong Kong do buy into uh, the, uh, the belief that uh, the law is 
targeted to a very small amount of people who have made offense against the the four areas uh, that uh, uh, the law has uh, tried to target it. So um, let's see how it goes. But currently, yeah. uh, the feelings in Hong Kong is, of course, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a watching out and see, trying to see what's going on. But nonetheless, I don't, we don't see any major chaos, major uh, unrest, major uncertainty, uh, that kind of things coming from the majority of the Hong Kong people. Yes, maybe we should wait uh, to see how it goes. But Mr. Liao, uh, of course, there are people in Hong Kong worried that it will erode the one country, two systems principle. Uh, will they still enjoy the freedom to criticize the government, to march on the streets, to express different opinions on the press? Uh, what is your take? Uh, I think this new law would in no way engender the uh, normal rights, the legitimate rights of uh, of uh, the Hong Kong people that is that that are protected by the basic law and also by the ICCPR. Uh, because I, if we read this uh, this this law carefully, I mean it, it is targeted upon those four categories of quite serious crimes. They're not just say you cannot enjoy free speech, you cannot enjoy for expression, it's just you cannot you cannot, I mean, commit sensation. You cannot commit subversion. You cannot, I mean, do terrorist, uh, I mean, activities. I, I guess no 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 one no normal person would say I would do these kind of things. So I don't think actually this law will engender the uh, the, the legitimate rights of uh, of Hong Kong people, and I don't think it will be a, a danger a risk towards the one country. To system because we must realize that one country is the uh, I mean the fund foundation for for two systems and as we have seen in the past uh, uh, several years especially in the past year actually the one country principle has been actually in endangered by those violent violence uh, in, in on the street and if we don't have one country I mean we cannot have really have two systems I mean, this this law instead instead of engendering one country two systems is, I mean, exactly to ensure that one country two systems mm. can go uh, steady and far. And, and Mr. Ma, um, this law passed uh, on the eve of July the first, uh, the 23rd anniversary of Hong Kong's return to China. Uh, do you think will things will be differently on the streets tomorrow? Well, that's a million-dollar question. Uh, what, I, what we've heard here is that although those major um, organizers um, and, um, and who support and coordinate at the top have are uh, trying to back out from these sort of um, activities now because of the enactment of the law, um, you don't know whether the, may, the many of the black-clad rioters would still be on the street because I've, we've heard rumors that tomorrow there would be a lot of people protesting um, and uh, starting from gatherings in the um, Victoria Park all the way to, to the evening. So we, we still have to wait to see as to whether the lowest level or lowest tier of protesters would still have their fi financial support and their coordination uh, orchestrated by probably foreign and local powers um, to, to, to um, come out to protest. So that would be something interesting to see, the actual response by the oppositions to this law tomorrow. And also, uh, there are some international uh, ramifications. The U.S. Senate uh, unanimously passed uh, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. That is an extension of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Chie, uh, first of all, what, what do you think of the Americans' intent of doing this at this particular time? A and all those policies, including uh, uh, the, the the stopping of uh, preferential trade policies and the ban on selling sensitive technologies to Hong Kong. Well, I, I think Hong Kong is uh, a, only a part of the overall uh, U.S. view on on the threat of China on the U.S. As China was, you know, is rising as a from the U.S. Pr perspective, uh, China is rising as a more uh, more powerful nation uh, that the U.S. felt there's a threat coming from China, 
and uh, they, they, the Americans or the American politicians, in my view, are seeing Hong Kong as part, uh, you know, a part of that chess game. And so whatever opportunity that they can use to try to discredit China or to try to entice China, uh, they will use it. And so Hong Kong becomes, uh, in, in this case, uh, very convenient for them. And of course, you know, Hong Kong, uh, because of its very special location and status, has been uh, a place of uh, where a lot of intelligence has been uh, get, being gathered. Mm. Uh, I think we, we, we all know that There's, it's not just today. It's been happening over the last uh, many decades. Uh, and, uh, you know, without a proper national security law, actually, a lot of people can do a lot of things without much sort of oversight. Uh, and now, you know, with the law and a lot of this kind of uh, so-called freedom uh, will be constrained. Uh, free I mean the freedom of collection of intelligence from foreign uh, parties. Mm. Uh, so it it's natural that, you know, one side will feel not very happy about it and they will try to do whatever they think is appropriate to, um, to in a way, to unveil their views uh, on the on the measures. But this so, is uh, punishing uh, uh, Hong Kong businesses as well as Hong Kong people. How painful will that be felt? Well, I think, um, of course, a lot of things will need to be worked out and we're going to have, you know, have to see. And of course, you know, the situation is also very, you know, evolving also from the U.S. side. But uh, if you look at just two, two dimensions, one is the trading. Uh, you know, because the U.S. government have uh, uh, have said they're going to suspend the special the trading status of Hong Kong. Mm. Uh, you know, but 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 the U.S. has been the major uh, beneficiary of the trade of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's uh, share of uh, you know trade with U.S. is actually fairly minor from the Hong Kong's perspective. So, from that perspective, the impact un is unlikely going to be very significant. But from the standpoint of sanctions on you know. Uh, more the sensitive, uh, you know, products, uh, partic in particular military sensitive products, that may have some implications for certain sectors of the Hong Kong industry. But largely speaking, Hong Kong doesn't really have a, a large manufacturing mm. industries anymore, uh, and it's become a large, a major service economy. So, you know, how much impact that, sen that kind of sanction would, would, would have for Hong Kong? Is, is highly questionable. But of course, we can't say for sure because things are still evolving and you don't yeah. know what else the U.S. government is going to do to Hong Kong. And, and Mr. Liao, the Chinese Foreign Ministry announced that visa restrictions were placed on U.S. officials for egregious conduct uh, related to Hong Kong after Washington announced uh, similar visa restrictions on Chinese officials. So many people say, well, what is happening in Hong Kong is just a piece of the puzzle between China and the U.S. rivalry. Is that, is that it? Uh, in some sense, yeah, because actually uh, this uh, new law passed by the U.S. Senate, I mean, it's, uh, it can be seen as an uh, old one in a new bottle. Actually, it, it, it traces back to as far as in 1992 when the U.S. Uh, passed the so-called Hong Kong, uh, U.S. Hong Kong Policy Act, which basically said that whenever the president of, of, of the United States, uh, when, they, when, when he think that mm. the, the, when he decides that the uh, Hong Kong have lost its uh, autonomy, uh, I mean, U.S. will cease to give Hong Kong, uh, we will suspend okay. its uh, special treatment uh, to Mr. Hong Liao, Kong. Mr. Liao, I have to cut you short there. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time. Thank you, Mr. Liao. Thank you, Mr. Xie, and thank you, no Mr. Problem. Ma. No problem. Okay. You're watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zulin Beijing. Goodbye.